Um, all right, this morning we're going to be talking about holiness this morning. I realized, I was talking to Rami to this, I'm getting ready to preach this message, that the whole entire time I grew up in church as a kid, um, I don't ever remember hearing a message just on holiness. Like, it wasn't a thing, and I noticed that a lot of churches don't teach on holiness for one reason or another. Um, but you know what, in the Church of God, we believe in holiness. We believe that God is holy, and the Scripture very clearly tells us to be holy for He's holy. So, and holiness and holy living and the things I'm going to talk about this morning is not just an idea. It's not like, well, I can do it if I want to. No, this is really a command from God. This is, we're talking about God's very heart this morning. This is the one thing that matters to God probably more than just about anything. Even in the Old Testament, we'll see in a little bit, um, he cares about this. This is because it's his character. The Bible says repeatedly over and over again that God is holy and he expects us to have a level of holiness in our life. And if I did not preach holiness, if I did not call you to a standard of holiness in this church, I'd fail to be preaching what matters most to God. So I'm probably going to step on your toes a little bit this morning as I talk about holiness. If holiness isn't a thing in your life, you might get offended once or twice. I just want you to know I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to fall on you, because <laughs> I'm an equal opportunity offender, amen? No. <laughs> you know, the person and work and the power of the Holy Spirit is fundamental to who we are as the people of God. Without the Holy Spirit, we'd have no transformation or no power to live in the kingdom or no power to live for Christ. We unashamedly own the truth that the Spirit can transform us, possess us, equip us, and empower us. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us, makes us holy, sets us apart for sacred service, and seals us for eternity's sake. It is the Spirit that convicts us of sin, enables us to overcome sin. It is the Holy Spirit that can breathe supernatural gifts into us for Jesus' sake. He is the comforter promised by Jesus and the witness of our redemption, as I talked about last week. Yesterday, we were out grocery shopping, and we, were, when we normally, we almost always go to the Walmart over there on the other side of the bridge in Ohio. And I always like, I just like to share my faith. I like to talk to random people. And I'll tell you, when I go to with Jessica, it gets a little weird at times, but <laughs> I'll share this. But we're, we were in line checking out, and we were having, Rami and I were talking about the church, we are talking about this morning, and it piqued enough interest with the cashier. So we looked at the cashier, and we said, you know, do you go to church anywhere? And the cashier gives us the answer that I hear almost daily in our community, no, I don't. I said, well, have you ever gone to church? Yes, I grew up in church. I got saved when I was a kid. I went to so-and-so church. I'm not going to call any churches out this morning. I said, well, what happened? And she looks at us, and she says, you know what? She said, when I was growing up as a kid, I really wanted to believe in Jesus. I really wanted to believe in church, she said, but I, but I saw the hypocrisy of the whole thing. He said, the people in my life who claim to be Christians never lived like Christians. They were evil. They were, they were addicted. They did all kinds of things that, that if, if the church would have saw them doing, we probably wouldn't have got kicked out of church. But my family was really good at hiding things, so nobody knew. So on Sunday morning, we're in church, and everything's great. She said, but when I was home the rest of the week, it was hell. And she said, I gave up. She said, I thought, like, if this is what it's all about, I don't want nothing to do with that. So she said, I haven't been to church since I was a kid. And I was standing there, and my heart just broke hearing that. And I was like, man, I'm so sorry. I'm saying, let me tell you, I'm a pastor. And you could tell the minute she kind of looks at me like, uh-oh, <laughs> like I'm going to judge her or something. She's like, I don't want to be judged. I said, it's not my job to judge you. I said, I want to tell you that God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. And I'm so sorry that you had that experience. And she said, well, that's the first time anybody's ever told me that. <laughs> I said, what would it take you to get you to come to church? She said, uh, I ain't doing it. <laughs> She said, the church is full of hypocrites. I said, well, it's true that the church is full of people, but I said, there's also a lot of good people in the church that are at least trying to walk with Jesus. I said, you know, I said, what if I can invite you to a church that was non-judgmental and point you to Jesus? Would you come? And she said, oh, I'll think about it. <laughs> so, so I almost got her to say yes, right? And then my daughter's like, it's the greatest church. We hug each other. We kiss each other. And she goes into this, this touchy-feely kind of, you know, and <laughs> the girl's like, she, you could just tell the look on her face. It was like, yeah, I don't know about that. So, but so anyways, I did give her an invite, told her about Easter, so I'd love to hey, join us and so on. So I pray that she'd check us out. But so often I hear this over and over again, and I have to be guilty. I'll tell you, as your pastor, in my early walk of Christ, I was just as guilty as everybody else of going to church on Sunday and worshiping, but then the rest of the week I had, an, I had some unholiness in my life. You know, I had to deal with my foul mouth as a young man and and just, like, I think sometimes in church we take it for granted that we think people around us know that God loves them, and maybe, maybe they know the idea, 
but it's not until they see God's love in us. And the only way they're going to see God's love in us is in holiness. For Hebrews, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says this, strive for living at peace and holiness for which no one, without either, no one will see Christ. Like, your level of holiness shows how much you love God. If you have no desire for holiness in your life, and you have no desire for trying to live a holy life, I'm going to say it very plainly this morning, then you really have no desire for Christ. Because Christ was holy. It's who he is. And to have Christ in our lives is to accept that holiness and want to be like him. But if you have no desire to be like him and live a holy life, and you're just making an excuse for sin and just doing everything that the Bible says not to do, I would really plainly say that you probably got a salvation issue this morning that we need to work out. Like holiness, your level of holiness, because what holiness is, God loves you this morning, and our response back to his love is how we live for him. It's, 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 our, it's our sacrifice. It's, it's me deciding, okay, God, you love me so much that I'm going to take my life and I'm going to set it aside and say, okay, it's for you. You know, take my heart, God. And so this morning, holy living is something I believe in so much that I, I also believe that it's, it's, it's widely missing in the church. Like you look around the world we live in and, and, and do, you, do you see the holy bride of Christ? You see so many churches that are, are compromising on sin, saying yes to things that God says no to. They're, they're living a level of unholiness where, where we have forgotten that God calls us out of the world. So instead of being out of the world, we've just let the world in. And, and we care more about being popular and being cool. I mean, it's a social media, right? Being a social media influencer and, and following who knows what and so on and so on, all that kind of stuff. That I, that, I, that, I, that I wonder if as Christians, as followers of Christ, have we even thought about holiness? Do, do I get up each day and think, like, am I living in holiness? Is, is my life holy? Is my life an example? Because, like, you know, you hear so often people will say, Oh, you know, especially people who don't like to share their faith. If you don't like to talk to strangers and you're not the one of those people who like to share your faith, I hear often, like, I'll just let my life speak. But, you know, for the millions of people I've heard, like, I'll let my life speak. I've never seen anybody come to Christ because of the way somebody lives. Very rarely, if ever. It's because of holiness. Does, holy, does, does being holy, is it even something you think about? doesn't matter. When, when you think about your attitudes and your behavior, your choices, what you think, the stuff that lives inside of you that nobody can see, is it holy? It, it, have you decided in your life to, you know, when you're in church, it, it's easy in church to be holy and be like, oh, I praise you, you know, for oceans and, and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's easy to come in church. It's, it's easy to, to put on Christianity, which is, I really think, for a lot of people, just a form of religion. I believe in the church as a religious spirit where more people are just being religious than holy. So we, we come to church and we do it because it's, it's a duty, it's a habit. I grew up in church and all that kind of stuff. But, but holiness is, have I taken my life and have I set it apart for God? Have I said, okay, God, I want nothing but you this morning. My prayers that talk about holiness this morning, that maybe in your heart this morning, you'll just take it and set it aside and say, you know what, God, it's yours. And because of who you are, God, and I'm living for you, then I'm going to examine myself this morning and say, what is the level of holiness in my life? And this message, I think, is probably it's just so important. It's so important that I'm going to pray for myself before I even read the scripture this morning. So let's pray. God, I pray this morning. Father, I know how much you love us. I believe, God, with all my heart that you're a God of love. But God, I also know that the scripture very clearly teaches that you're a holy God, a God that's set apart. There's none like you, none ever. And God, you've always wanted a relationship with people that would set, be set aside to be yours, a holy people. And that wasn't just an Old Testament idea, God. It's a New Testament. It's a thing that should be in the church. So Lord, I pray this morning as we open the scripture that you would help us examine our lives, examine our hearts. And if there's an holy thing in this room this morning, 
an unholy attitude, an unholy sin, and whatever it is that's unholy in our lives. This morning, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to deal with it so that we could be a people of your possession. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn me to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. Paul, writing to the church, says this. Now this I say in testifying the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the fruitality of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy practice, and every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and you were taught him, and in the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, which is corrupt through... Um, deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to be put on the new self created in the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Paul is saying, "There's when we come to Jesus Christ, man. If you if you confess Jesus Christ, Lord, and you ask Him to forgive you your sins, and you place your faith in Him, then there's something old that's got to come off, and something new that gets put on. And that new thing is righteousness and holiness. Holiness. Now." Holiness is loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. I talked about that a couple weeks ago. And loving our neighbors as ourselves. Simply put, holiness is Christ-likeness. Jesus was holy. Everything about him was holy. Holiness is not an it, as if I have to get it. It's a command. It's in him. It's in him I find purity and power and obedience. Jesus Christ himself is the definition of holiness and a living example. He loved his father and his neighbor perfectly, and obedience springs from love. Thus, holiness is perfect love. I can preach on many things in the church, but I said if I fail to preach a biblical standard on holiness, I fail at the, I fail at the thing that most matters to God. The Bible is a story of one relationship with a holy God desiring a relationship with his creation, the people he created, and the people that he desired to love and bless and to see flourish and fill this world. And that not only counts the people of old, but it also counts you and me today. God chose the people for himself, and all he wanted from those people was for them to return his love and faithfulness, obedience and holiness. After God set people free, he set out to show them and teach them what matters most to him. He gave them the Old Testament law, and that was a way to teach them about right and wrong, about sin, and how to worship, and how to love, and how to get right with him when things went wrong. But there's one thing that sums up the whole entire thing, and it's the great commandment, which is to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, your soul, and your strength, and to love your neighbor. His love is living, to love him in return is to live a holy life. He told this to Moses right in the middle of the law. When, when God was laying down the law, Leviticus 19, 1 and 2, he stopped for a second. He told Moses this in verse 1, and the Lord said to Moses, saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord God, am holy. Even when God was summoning up the law, and if you could sum up the whole entire law in the Old Testament, it was this. God wanted a people of his own possession. God wanted a people that would, that would accept his love and love him in return. And those people would separate themselves from the, from the evil world around them and just choose to be holy, choose to be dedicated back to God, choose that living for God was more important than the riches and the wealth and, and everything else. And what we see in the Old Testament so many times is that God causes people back to repentance. And they repent and they fall. They repent, they fall. They repent, they fall. And, and over and over and over again. And the reason they keep falling is because they keep looking into the world around them. And God's like, I, God didn't want them to mix with the pagan nations and the sin around them. I said, God said, kept calling them out of that. Say, no, don't do what they do. But they kept whoring after the money and the riches and the women and, and everything else, just lusting after the things that God said no to. And every time we lust after something God says no to, we fall. You can't be in the world and of the world and be in Christ. The same command this because a little bit later he said this in Leviticus 20, 26. He again repeats, he says, You shall be holy to me, for the Lord, for I the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Now I know you think this morning that, well, Bob, that's the old testament. It's not. <laughs> This is God showing his heart for his people, and we're going to see this in the New Testament. You could not live an unholy life and be his. 
Because holiness separates us from God. Unholiness, sin, and just unholy living is the very reason why Jesus came into the world and paid such a great sacrifice. Because he wanted us to separate ourselves and give our lives back to God and say, it's yours. But too often we have an unholy attitude. We have things in our life, and we never not, we just ignore it. You can't have unholiness in your life and get close to a holy God. It doesn't work that way. And this is, so many people will say, well, I, I just don't feel that close to Christ. I don't, I, don't, I don't hear God speak. I don't feel like the Holy Spirit's moving or whatever it is in your life. And I'm going to ask you this. If you don't feel that close to God, then what in your life isn't supposed to be there? Today we have the same problem they had in the Old, in the Old Testament. <laughs> God has chosen us and set us apart for his own and called us to holiness and faithfulness to him, and we're still trying to please ourselves. We repent, we fall, and over and over again wondering, is this it? And the apostle Peter said this, writing to the church in 1 Peter 2.9, he says this, he wants to remind you, this is it. listen to this this morning, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You, new beginnings, you who are here this morning, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are a chosen race of people. The church is God's chosen ones. You're supposed to be a royal priesthood. A priest, a priestess, a holy nation. We live in an unholy world, amen? We're supposed to be a holy nation. There's supposed to be a separation. The church should not look like the rest of the world. There should be a dramatic difference. It should be light and day. It'd be like the world's in darkness, and when the church shows up, the lights turn on. You're not supposed to look like your neighbors and your coworkers and everybody else. There's supposed to be a light inside of you called holiness that people see that you are dedicated to the Father. You're a holy priesthood. You are for his own possession. A holy God in Christ Jesus knows that we're unholy, amen? But with the finished work at a cross, a transformation and a change takes place. And you have the power to take off that old, sinful, dying self and clothe yourselves with Christ in righteousness so when God sees you, you're, you're his own possession. Like God wants to take ownership of you. He wants such a relationship that, that you and him are one. Like, like it's not that you and God are 10,000 miles apart and he's over there and you're over here. God wants the kind of relationship which you're like, you're like right with each other. But you won't get that living with some unholiness in your life. You won't. God can have nothing to do with sin. Same God, same expectation. The church is God's chosen people. The church is the bride of Christ. We are the church that God wants from you is for you to respond to his love and faithfulness and obedience. When Christ spoke to the bride, he said this, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Church, you know Jesus loves you this morning? That he gave himself up for her, it's us. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing in the water with the word. You will never achieve a level of holiness in your life without God's word. It'll never happen. If, you, if, you, if you're one of those people that you're like, I just can't read the Bible, I don't read the Bible, whatever, that's the reason why you have issues. It's the reason why your level of holiness is not where it should be. You need to be washed in the word, which means, you know what? When I get into scripture every single morning, when I have my time with God, that's what I pray. God, would your word just wash over me? And what it does is it washes over me, it corrects me, it trains me, it rebukes me, it lifts me off for righteousness. I, will never, I, have, I would have never gotten to where I am today had I not had a healthy relationship with the very thing that I need to wash me every day because Jesus wants to sanctify me. He wants to sanctify you. This is the wonderful thing about this conversation is that Jesus, with the finished work on the cross, he knows who you are. He knows your attitudes, your hurts, your hang-ups, and your, all that kind of stuff. He wants you to get in his word because he wants to wash you, but he wants to sanctify you. He wants to change you from the inside out. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But you got to let him in. you got to let him in. 
And that starts with a set of choices. It says this, so that he might present the church to himself. Get this, he takes possession of the church, right? It's his. And splendor, without any spot or wrinkle, any such thing, that he, that she, the church, get this, that she might be holy without blemish. Repeat after me. Look to somebody that says, when the church is supposed to be holy. The church is supposed to be holy. Okay, now let's get honest here for a second. When you look around the church, and I mean the big C church, church around the world, do you really see holiness? Do you see holiness when you see churches compromising on truth? Do you see holiness when a church fails to love their neighbor like themselves? Do you see holiness when the the very people who accept what Christ did on the cross are the very people who are still living in sin? Who, 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 who have attitudes and addictions and problems and things that Jesus died for, and yet we just overlook it? That's not what he died for. He died to give you the most wonderful gift, your sanctification, to cleanse you, so that you, so that we together, when the world sees us, you know what? We often say, what's the church known for? And we'll say, well, love. Well, Amen. But we also should be known for our holiness. When you look at this whole entire community, a whole entire neighborhood, what New Beginning should have above everything else is that we're a holy people who love God. Not that we have the best outreach events or we do whatever, or that we're loving people, all that kind of stuff. We want to be known for the kind of people that love God so much that we are an example of holiness. Which means we've got to deal with the sin in the church. If you want a kind of pastor who's going to overlook your sin and pat you on the back and tell you a good job and whatever, I'm not that guy for you. <laughs> but if you want somebody who's going to call you to a holy relationship with the living God and get right with Jesus, I'm here for you this morning. Each of us sanctified, cleansed so that we are without defect. I love that. Like when Christ came on me and God forgave me of my sins, I was not perfect on that first day. <laughs> It's a process. It's, it's a decision every single day to just walk with him and say, you know what, Lord, you need, I, don't know how, I would pray, Holy Spirit, you need to just do a work in me. But you know what he does? He does. It's, it's incredible. Holy without sin. Would you say your life this morning is without sin? Be honest. Are you holy without sin this morning? Does that describe you? <laughs> Fed on the word. Would you say this morning that you're fed on the word, that you're stuffed on the word? (laughs) You feel like it's all over you. You, you, You're holy, you're without sin, and you're fed on the word. Does that describe you this morning? It should. It should. That's why Jesus went to the cross. If not, then there's some examination that needs to take place. You need to get honest. You need to get right. So Paul gives us the he. How do we get to this place? How do how do I get to a place of holiness in my life? And and while I could cover a hundred different scriptures this morning, Paul pretty much lays it out in Ephesians four. He said, first thing is that you kind of die to your old self. Ephesians four twenty two: to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through its deceitful desires. In order to follow Jesus, a death needs to take place. You need to die to yourself. You need to die to all your sin, your old habits, and everything that would keep you from Christ. Everything that's keeping you from Christ must die. Everything that keeps you from getting in the, in the way, everything that keeps getting in the way of your salvation must die. Everything that's preventing your sanctification must die. It must. Jesus said this in Luke 14, 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You cannot You cannot. You can convince yourself all day that you're a Christ follower, but if there's sin and unholiness and a lack of repentance in your life, you are not. You're putting on a costume that's not who you really are. So have you chosen Jesus, honestly? Have you? Gone in. Have you accepted the fact that he died a brutal, painful death on the cross? Not so that you could stay your old, broken self, so that that old, sinful part of you could die with him and he could replace it with life. Have you taken that gift upon yourself? The greatest hindrance to your holiness is not dying to yourself. That's our biggest problem. We're, we like to please ourselves. 
We like things that we shouldn't. We don't want to die to ourselves. Most of us will tell you, my biggest problem is I just don't like somebody telling me what to do. Come on, honestly. You don't want somebody to tell you what to do, right? So when somebody does tell you what to do, you get angry, you hide, you run away, you just do whatever. And yet God's telling you what to do. (laughs) Why people don't read the Bible? Because they don't like to be told what to do. Because page after page, God is calling you to repentance and holiness. And you're like, I just can't read it. I just can't understand it. No, you don't want to be told what to do. Just being honest with you this morning. You don't want the Bible telling you you're wrong. You don't want the Bible to tell you to stop doing what you're doing. You don't want the Bible to confront your bad attitude. (laughs) You don't want it to confront your stinky fruit. You you don't want the Bible to tell you that your heart's got some rocks in it. And that's why you act the way you do and think the way you do and talk the way you do. No, no, you're just like, I'm just going to stay away from it. You can't. (laughs) You can't because God's calling you into a loving relationship with him and he will not leave you alone. So if you're feeling the convictions of your sin, you better praise God because he loves you. And if you're feeling a call to holiness in your life, praise God that he's calling you out of yourself because he wants the old you to die so that he can clothe you with the new you. And you know what that new you is? It's him. It's Christ-likeness. You cannot be born again without dying yourself. Some of you have been lied to. You've gone to church and you heard a message and you got convicted and you went to the altar and that day you were feeling guilty and then you said, well, sinner's prayer, some superstitious thing like that. And then you walked away thinking like you're saved, but nothing changed. You know why nothing changed? Because you did not die to yourself on that altar. You prayed the wrong prayer. It wasn't, Father, just forgive me. It was, Father, help me die to myself. Let the old me die. Take it in the grave and bury it, Jesus, because I want the new self. Most of us, we haven't prayed like that, have we? When's the last time you prayed and said, God, I need to die to this attitude I have? This unholy attitude I have, this sin, this problem of looking at things and touching things and watching things and listening to things and doing things that I should not be doing. God, I need to die to all of that so that you could take over. The new life that Christ offers each of us is the one where we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot occupy an unholy space. It can't. (laughs) He's he's holy. God can have nothing to do with sin. And the Holy Spirit of Jesus, they're three in one. They're exactly the same. They cannot occupy an unholy space. So the sin in your life that you're trying to hold on to and have Jesus at the same time, that does not work. You're playing tug of war with a God and you're not going to win. So in order for Christ to take over in your life, in order for your heart to really be regenerated, to really be born again, for for you to really change, you need to die to yourself. And that unholiness in your life needs to die so that God's holy presence can fill you completely. For the Holy Spirit to be the most active in your life, you got to give him the space. Which means I can't be like, oh, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, while I'm cussing and drinking and doing all kinds of just evil. It don't work that way. When's the last time you heard a pastor preach this? Renewed thinking. You're not going to hear it in some other places. Oh, you want to sin? That's okay. That's between you and God. Oh, God is so loving that we don't want to talk about sin, right? Because you know what? I don't want to offend anybody. Oh, lo and behold, somebody gets offended. I call them out of unrighteousness. Oh, I can say the word I was thinking. I want you in heaven. I want you to have a transformative relationship with Jesus. I want the church that I'm pastoring to be a holy church. I want you to die to yourself the way I've died, I died to myself. What would bring me down to Canova, West Virginia, from Michigan, away from my family and away from my grandkids, here pastoring a church in a community I didn't grow up in? I died to myself. Renewed thinking, Ephesians 4.23. says, and be renewed by the spirit of your minds. How do you become renewed in the spirit of your mind? The answer is to fill your mind continually with the truth of God's word. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing we discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul exhorts his readers to no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Let me tell you this one. This is some things an unholy mind would say. You're going to love this. An unholy mind says things like this. It's not a big deal. I'm sinning. I got a bad attitude. I'm not loving the people around me. I'm just doing the opposite of what God says. And an unholy mind says, it's not a big deal. How about the next one? I'm not hurting anyone. How often do we make excuse for our sin and say, I'm not hurting anyone? It doesn't make me struggle. Oh, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said that, who had sin in their life and was sinning, committing adultery or something worse, and be like, it doesn't make me struggle. Guess what? The truth is, we've never been good judges on what makes us struggle. The heart's deceitful above all things. Your mind is corrupt. Like, you are not a good judge of what makes you struggle. So this is what a holy mind does. The holy mind says this, what does God think about this? When I have a rotten, stinky attitude, I need to stop and ask myself, what does God think about the way I'm acting? My holy father's going to put me over his knee and give me a spanking sometimes, right? Amen. What does God's word say about this? Here's our biggest problem. This is why so many Christians and so many churches are living in sin because they don't read their Bible. So they're unaware. So they think, what's the big deal? It doesn't make me struggle. Well, here's the big deal. God addresses it. And Paul says those who continue to live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We read that last week, Galatians 5. How about this? Does this, what I'm doing, does this offend God? Are you worried about offending God? Does what I'm doing, does it offend God? Does what I believe, what I think, does the thing I'm supporting, watching, reading, listening to, the secret habits that nobody knows about except for me, does it offend God? Does does what's in your heart this morning, does it offend God? You might be like, well, it's not hurting anybody else. I didn't ask you that. Does it offend God? So you think nobody knows, but does it offend God? The next thing a holy holy mind does, does this grieve the Holy Spirit? If God has indwelled his spirit inside you for holiness, then does the very thing I'm doing, does the Holy Spirit take issue with it? It doesn't make me struggle. I didn't ask you that. Does it make the Holy Spirit struggle? Next time you're looking at pornography on the computer, oh, it doesn't make me struggle. You're watching a movie on HBO or Showtime or wherever it is, it's got stuff in it you should be watching. Or you're listening to music with filthy language, you're reading, the, reading a romance novel, or whatever it is that you know there's sin involved in it, you're gambling, I, I just, whatever it is you're doing, lying, cheating, gossiping, I don't care, whatever it is, whatever it is that you think nobody else does and you just think you're just getting away with it, it's not hurting anybody, is the Holy Spirit offended by it? Yes. Yes. They are. Is this something? Here's, a, here's another thing a holy mind will ask. Is this something that put Jesus Christ on the cross? Is this something? Is what I'm doing, is this the very thing that put Jesus on the cross? An unholy mind is all about me, but a holy mind is all about God. Amen. What's on your mind this morning? Colossians 3, 2 and 3 says this. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are earth. For you have died. Have I died? Have you died? And your life is now hidden in Christ and God. Fill your mind with the truth of heaven. You will never get to a place of personal holiness in your life without the truth. You have to have a healthy diet of God's word. And how do you find such truth? It's the word of God. It's like baby step number one for holy living it's just to get in the word. This is why Jesus said, man can't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God. Like, like baby step number one for trying to get a holy life is to get your mind right and get your heart right. And you can only do that through the word of God. How do I know that I have holiness in my life? How do I know? One, am I living with my new self? Ephesians 4.24, put on your new self. Colossians 3, the same kind of clue about the meaning of the new person we're supposed to put on. Paul says this, put on as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. 
my new self is going to be grounded and rooted in the fruits of the Spirit. So what I do is I, I look in that list in Galatians 5, I say, am I more loving? Kind, patient, good, self-control, the things that are the fruits of the Spirit. Is there a change? Can you look in the mirror this morning and ask yourself, is there a change? Love and holiness. The new person is a bundle of attitudes and emotion and practices that Jesus has called us to become. Is your life marked by the Holy Spirit, by the fruits of the Spirit? This is a daily choice. We have to get up each day and remind ourselves that we are God's chosen ones, holy and loved. Every single time we get to thinking about something else about ourselves, like I'm not worthy, we have to tell ourselves I'm chosen. Every time we get to thinking that we're not loved, we have to remind ourselves how loved we are. Every time a sinful thought comes in, we have to rebuke it and correct it with the word and stand for Jesus. You have to take ownership of what comes in and out. How can we judge the level of holiness in our lives? Do I have power over willful sin? If you're indwelled with the Holy Spirit and you're being sanctified and God is working in you, then you know what? When sin comes, or you see some, you're going to stay away from it. You're going to do everything you can. You're going you're to have the power. This is how people who come into church can be a complete drunkard, a completely addicted, a completely whatever it is, and Jesus Christ comes on them and he heals them, and they no longer desire the things that they once did. And also there's this change that takes place, and they have the willful desire to stay away from it. Man, praise God. But you know what? If you, don't have, if you don't have a willful, if you don't have control over willful sin in your life, you got an issue. Can I honestly admit freedom from purposeful, and from purposeful unfaithfulness to God? Can you? Do I love others and God more than ever? A sign of sanctification in your life, a sign of holiness taking place, is that you're loving God more, that you came into a relationship with God. And the more you walk with God, the more you fall in love with him, and the more your life is set apart, and the more you desire to love your neighbor and love those in the church. Do you love your neighbor? Do you love the church? Are you committed to the church? It's hard to say that I love somebody if I'm in a part-time relationship with them. So am I committed to the church? Do I love God with all my heart? And does God see my love in my holiness and my dedication to him? And do others see my love because I'm loving them so well? Do you love God and others more? Third one is, is obedience the consuming passion of my heart? Is obedience the consuming passion of my heart? Do I desire more than anything else to just love Jesus and obey him? Do you? Ask yourself this morning. Is obedience a consuming passion? Jesus says this in John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It is a hard, you, you know, it's like this. If, I'm, if I, I'm married, if I tell my wife I love you, but I disrespect her, I'm dishonest with her, I lie to her, and I do everything opposite of what she asked me to do, how love you think she's going to be? That don't work in relationships, does it? I'm going to have a relationship with somebody in the church. Say, hey, Matt, I love you, but you know, bro, I'm going to disrespect you. I'm going to be dishonest with you. I'm going to lie about you. I'm going to gossip about you, and I'm just going to do all kinds of sinful stuff. Would you feel loved? No. Same way with God. You can't say, God, I love you, then go do the ex- exact opposite of everything he says to do, and then think he's going to be like, oh, good job. Do you love God enough that you're doing things his way? Do you understand that Jesus said this? If you love me, do you love, I'm in church, do you love Jesus this morning? Yes or no? Do you love Jesus this morning? All right, are you keeping his commands? Do you love Jesus this morning? Are you living a holy life? Is holiness something you're striving for? Do you love God enough that you put to death your flesh? Do you love Jesus enough this morning that you're taking up your cross and denying yourself? Lord, it's not what I want, it's what you want. You know, if more people were denying themselves, evangelism wouldn't be something that we'd have to talk about all the time. The church would be full of people coming to Jesus. Holiness without living it out is nothing. It's not about what we say to people. I could talk to you all day long and tell you how, how if you, it's just like this. I could get up here and I can preach every week, but if you didn't see me living it, would you, would you come to church and listen? If you didn't say the way I loved my wife and loved Jessica and the way I led my family and all the stuff I did, no, you got to live it. Like, you know I love you. I can say hard things to you because I hope you know it's coming from a loving place. Imagine that that's for everybody. 
You know, most of us, we want our kids more than anything. What's your team? You can head back up. We want our kids. Who, who doesn't want their kid to go to heaven? Right? You want your kid. You want, you want the little ones. Right? You all want your little ones to go to heaven. But here's the deal. If all you do is bring them to church and expect them to get Jesus in the church, and then you go home and live an unholy life, you're not raising up little disciples of Jesus who are ever going to commit to anything. They need to see this in you. Your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, and those people around you who need Jesus, they need to see holiness. They don't need you. You can go to somebody all day long and say, oh, I come to church. I come to the best church. I got the best church in the city. Boy, we got the best of everything. Just come to church. And they come to church, and there's a bunch of unholy people there. That's like my cashier yesterday. They come back. But, you know, people come into the church, and the people in the church are living a holy life, and you see the change in them. You see what God is doing in their lives. You know what? You st- even the worst sinner will come in and fall on their knees and say, I want that. Does the way you live, what does the way you live say about your faith? Have you died yourself this morning, church? Because if you hadn't, then over this next couple of songs, I want, you to, I want you to die this morning. I want you to die to yourself. If you came into church this morning and you know you had an unholy week, I don't want you to leave that way. I don't care if you got to fall flat, fall just face first flat on the ground this morning. If you need to get right with God, you better get right with God because he's got something for you. You cannot... It's claim to be a follower of God with an unholy heart and an unholy attitude. If your attitude this morning is unholy, I know some of you have got an unholy attitude. That needs to die this morning. If you've got some sin in your life this morning, it needs to die this morning. If you know this week that you've offended somebody, you've wronged somebody, you're not living at peace with somebody, you need to get right with somebody. You need to take the steps because what holiness is, it's a daily choice to do the right thing, not the wrong thing. It's just getting up each day saying, God, I love you enough to do the right thing, not the wrong thing. James says, if you know the good you ought to do, what? Do it, right? Do it. If you don't, it's... Amen. Let's pray. God, I pray this morning. God, I I believe 100% that you're touching a heart right now in this room. There's somebody in this room that's just got a bad attitude. They got an unholy attitude, and, and they, think, they don't think it's a big deal, God, but you think it's a big deal. God, the, you, 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 they think, well, it's not making anybody struggle, or they don't think anybody knows, but God, I know right now you know. And Lord, I can feel it. I can sense it in this room. I can sense it in the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. There's some people in this room that got an attitude problem. It's unholy, and it's not right. There's people in this room that have gossiped and slandered and talked trash, lie, cheat. There's people in this room that have hidden sins in their heart, in their life. They're doing things, God, that offend you. And yet they bought in the lie of the enemy that they don't think it's a big deal. God, I pray this morning that you refresh our conviction that it is a big deal. God, I pray for that for a single person as soon as when he would leave this church without repenting of their sins and turning it all back over to you. Lord, I pray every single person as soon as when he would fall on their knees and ask you to cleanse them, to take out all the spots, the wrinkles, and the blemishes, and the unholy things that are holding us back. Lord, I pray the most, the most unholy thing in our life is excuses. All the I can'ts, I won'ts, and all that stuff that's just nonsense. Because if we have you, we can do so much more. So Lord, I pray this morning that somebody, you're touching somebody's heart right now, I know you are. And they're struggling, Lord. They're, they're playing tug of war with you. Because they, they, they want to hide it. They want to think it's not a big deal. But, but God, it's a big deal. Lord, I'm praying right now for somebody's salvation this morning. Somebody who maybe they thought they're saved, but they've, been, they've just been religious. They really haven't given everything over to you, Lord. Lord, I'm praying for a Christian in this room this morning who's forgotten to die to themselves. Have all kinds of judgment, Lord. There's some of us in the church, Lord, that we, we could judge everybody. We could tell you what everybody else is doing, but we're not honest about what's in our heart. Oh, let me tell you about them people. God, we do that. But we're not honest about what's in our heart, and what's in our heart is what matters to you, God. God, I pray for I just pray for the sin in the church. 
Lord, we, we've bought into the lie from the devil that, that we could be in the world and be of the world and be part of the world and act like the world, and that's not true. We make excuses for the things we do behind closed doors, and God, you know. So, Lord, I pray this morning that you would cleanse us. Jesus, you promise it's your desire to cleanse the bride, to cleanse it, to clean it, to wash it in the water and the regeneration of your word. Lord, I pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit that you would wash each and every one of us, that you would cleanse each and every one of us, that each and every one of us would decide this moment, this day, moving forward, that we're going to walk in holiness before you because we want to respond to your love by loving you faithfully in return. So help us, Father, to say no to the excuses of the world that it doesn't matter because it does matter. And help us, Father, to be the kind of church that we don't compromise on holiness, that this is a standard, this is a command, this is, this is not something to take lightly. So God, we desire here to be a holy people. God, we, we want to be chosen and set apart and holy and used by you to win our friends, our family, and our neighbors, and our community for Jesus. Lord, I pray we wouldn't talk a big game, but we would live a big game. And on a day where so many of us are so concerned about football, we'd be more concerned about our souls. I pray in Christ's name we pray.